Good day, Grade 12s. Welcome to the introductory session of the final Life Science exam preparation for Paper 2. It is important for you to be successful in the NSC examination at the end of 2022, and to achieve this, it will take extra effort and work from you. We have taken time to prepare this kit to enable you to achieve this goal in life sciences. This document has been prepared as study material for the final examinations for Grade 12 Life Sciences. The materials have been arran arranged in such a way that studying can be undertaken topic-wise. Within each topic, core notes have been included according to the 2021 Examination Guideline document. Questions were selected such that the core concepts and core skills are assessed and practiced. The action words have been underlined in the questions so that you can follow the instructions of the questions. For the different topics for paper 2 will be as follows. DNA code of life, 27 out of the 150 marks. Meiosis, 21 marks. Genetics and inheritance, 48 marks and evolution 54 out of the 150 marks. The format for both examination papers um, will be the same and as follows. Each paper is divided into two sections. Section A, short answer questions, um, such as multiple choice questions, give the correct term for, column statements and items, data response, and some diagrams to label. Section B, out of 100, there will be two questions of 50 marks each, and both of these questions will be divided into two to four subsections. Um, a graph might also appear in section B. Then some general instructions and information for each paper. Please remember to answer all the questions in each paper. Number your answers correctly according to the numbering system used in the question paper. Present your answers according to the instructions of each question. So it's important to read instructions for each question. Do all drawings in pencil and label them in blue or black ink. Draw diagrams, tables or flowcharts only when asked to do so. Do not use graph paper. If you have to draw a graph, use the folio in your answer booklet. Um, you may use a non-programmable calculator for calculations. Please make sure that you have a protractor and a compass with you for a possible pie chart. And then lastly, write neatly and legibly. Some exam tips on different types of exam questions. Firstly, a multiple choice question. Typically, various options are provided as possible answers. You have to choose the correct answer and write only the letter A to D next to the question number in your answer book. When answering a multiple choice question in section A, read through the question very carefully. Also, look at the four options very carefully, evaluate each option, eliminate each incorrect option, and only one option must be written down next to the question number. Another type of question from section A is terminology, where you have to give the correct biological term for a specific description or statement. Make sure of the correct spelling of the biological terms and then, very important, use the scientific terminology and not common names. Another type of question from section A is where two columns are given. The first column contains a description or a statement and column two contains two items or terms. Follow the instruction very carefully. You have to indicate whether each of the statements in column 1 apply to A only, B only, both A and B, or none of the items in column 2. Write A only, B only, both A and B, or none next to your question number. Question words help you to answer questions. It is important to look for these question words. These are words that tell you what to do. And 
you use them to correctly understand what the examiner is asking. Use these words when answering questions. In this first example, it says, give only the letter. Follow the instruction to the T here. Typically, a diagram will be given, a question relating to that diagram, but the key words here, give only the letter. Other questions might require you to write down both the letter and the name. The, the example here, give the letter and the name of the part that transmits impulses away from the cell body in the diagram representing the structure of a neuron. So you look at the diagram and find the part that is transmitting impulses away from the cell body. You give the letter representing that particular part and also the name of that part. Some other keywords or stem words, calculations. Calculate. This means a numerical answer is required. In general here, you should show your working or your calculation and make sure that if units are involved, that your answer has a unit. Define. Give a clear meaning of the term. Give a definition for that term. Describe. State in words the main points of a structure or a process. Explain. Make clear. Interpret. Spell out. Typically cause and effect. List. Write a list of items with no additional detail. And then tabulate. Draw a table and indicate the answer as direct pairs. Two kinds of nucleic acids are found in a cell, namely DNA and RNA, or then deoxyribonucleic acid and ribonucleic acid. These two nucleic acids are made of building blocks or monomers known as nucleotides. DNA is present in the nucleus and mitochondria of all cells and also located in the chloroplasts of plant cells. We will take a look at two types of RNA, namely messenger RNA and transfer RNA. mRNA is formed in the nucleus and functions at the ribosomes in the cytoplasm. tRNA is located within the cytoplasm. The natural shape of the DNA molecule is a double helix. That means it consists of two strands of nucleotides forming a twisted ladder. It is important to remember when asked for the shape or the structure of DNA to answer double helix. As stated before, the monomers of DNA are called nucleotides. Each nucleotide consists of three parts. The diagram at the top right represents one nucleotide. The three components making up a nucleotide are a nitrogenous base, and there are four different types of bases, adenine, thymine, guanine, and cytosine. These nitrogenous bases are linked by means of weak hydrogen bonds. Pairing of bases occurs as follows. Adenine links with thymine, and guanine links with cytosine. This pairing is known as complementary base pairing. The second part is a sugar, and in the case of DNA, that sugar is known as deoxyribose. And the third part is a phosphate portion. A nitrogenous base always attaches to the sugar part of the nucleotide. The diagram at the bottom right illustrates part of a DNA molecule made of 10 nucleotides. Make sure you count 10 nucleotides. You must be able to label a diagram showing a DNA molecule like that. DNA has two main functions. Number one, DNA makes up genes which carry hereditary information. Number two, DNA carries the coded message for the synthesis of proteins. DNA replication is a process that you must know very well, step by step. Replication means to make exact copies of. DNA replication takes place during interphase, that means before cell division can take place. DNA replication is important as it ensures that genetic material can be shared um, by the two daughter cells. 
and that identical daughter cells are formed. Next, the process of replication. You must be able to describe this process. The double helix structure of the DNA molecule unwinds and the two strands appear in the shape of a ladder. The weak hydrogen bonds break and the two strands unzip. Both these two strands will now serve as a template. Free-floating nucleotides in the nucleoplasm build a complementary strand onto each of the original two strands. Adenine bonds with thymine, guanine bonds with cytosine. Each original DNA strand serves as a template on which its complement forms. Two identical copies are formed from the original DNA molecule each comprising one new strand and one original strand. When DNA is extracted from body cells, that DNA is prepared, arranged, and the barcode pattern is obtained. These patterns of bars coincide with the sequence of base pairs that a person inherits from his or her parents. The nitrogenous base sequence of a child is a combination of the basis of the mother and the father. This barcode pattern is known as a DNA profile. Each individual has his or her own unique DNA profile, except for identical twins. DNA profiling is used to identify crime suspects in forensic investigations as proof of paternity, and also to identify dead bodies and relatives. Skin, blood, saliva, semen or even hair is often collected at a crime scene and these samples can then be used to extract and analyze DNA. Below is an example of DNA profiling during a crime scene investigation. The bars of the DNA profile found at the crime scene are the same as the bars on the DNA profile of suspect 2. Therefore, suspect 2 is guilty. Let's look at an example question on DNA. The diagram below represents a portion of a DNA molecule. You can see there it has a ladder shape, so it's untwisted. Identify parts B, C, and D. B refers to one nitrogenous base, C refers to the phosphate group, and D refers to the weak hydrogen bonds joining two nitrogenous bases. 1.2 monomer A, monomer is a building block. If you look at A, you'll see it's made up of three components. There's a phosphate group, there's a sugar and a nitrogenous base. Those three components make up a nucleotide. So 1.2a is a nucleotide. Number 1.2b, name one organelle in a cell where DNA is located. You're only required to, to mention one. Nucleus is an option. You can also answer mitochondria. Or you can also answer chloroplasts, so any one of those organelles. 1.3, how many nucleotides are shown in the diagram? So it's important that you know what a nucleotide is. Just to recap, a nucleotide is made up of a phosphate, a sugar, and a nitrogenous base. If you count the nucleotides within this diagram, hopefully you'll get the correct answer, which is 8. The following is an example question on DNA profiling. You can clearly see the barcoded patterns on the DNA profile of five individuals. Question 4.1. Identify the technique shown above. This is, of course, DNA profiling. 4.2. Which male is the biological father of the child? 
So you have to identify the biological father of the child. First, you're going to compare the bars of the child with the bars of the mother and see which ones they share. The child's second, third and last bars correspond with the bars of the mother. Now you look at the remaining bars of the child, which are the first, the fourth and the fifth bars, and check which of the males have bars overlapping with these bars of the child. And that brings you to male three. So male three is the biological father. Question 4.3, explain your answer to question 4.2. So you have to explain how you got to male 3 as the biological father. So you first compared the bands or the bars that the mother and child have in common. And then check which of the males have the rest of the bars in common with the rest of the child's bands, which is of course male 3. Question 4.4. State two other uses of this technique. Other users, in other words, other than determining de uh, paternity. We have touched on this earlier. DNA profiling can also be used in forensic investigations to identify crime suspects. It can be used to identify dead bodies and also to identify relatives. RNA is also nucleic acid, just like DNA. There are differences between the structure of DNA and RNA, so look out for these differences as we go through the structure of RNA. As RNA is also nucleic acid, its building blocks or monomers are also called nucleotides. Each nucleotide has three components. Number one, a nitrogenous base. There are four different bases, namely adenine, guanine, cytosine, and uracil. The second component is a sugar. In the case of RNA, the name of the sugar is ribose. And the third component is the phosphate group. RNA is a single-stranded molecule, therefore no base pairing occurs. I hope you have spotted some of the differences between DNA and RNA. Let's summarize. DNA is a double helix, whereas RNA is a single-stranded molecule. The sugar in DNA is known as deoxyribose. The sugar in RNA is ribose. The nitrogenous bases in DNA are adenine, guanine, cytosine, and thymine. The nitrogenous bases in RNA are adenine, guanine, cytosine, and then replacing thymine is uracil. In DNA, the number of adenine and thymine is equal, and there's also an equal number of guanine and cytosine because of base pairing occurring. In RNA, Adenine, uracil, guanine and cytosine occur in any number or ratio because of the fact that no base pairing occurs. The two types of RNA you're going to learn more about are messenger RNA or mRNA and transfer RNA or tRNA. These two types of RNA play a huge role in protein synthesis. mRNA carries the genetic code from DNA in the nucleus to the ribosomes in the cytoplasm and therefore acts as a messenger. tRNA picks up amino acids in the cytoplasm and takes them to the ribosomes where protein synthesis occurs and therefore acts as a transfer molecule. And then lastly, you must be able to recognize and label a diagram as the one shown at the bottom left. 
Protein synthesis is the process where proteins are made. To synthesize a particular protein, amino acids have to join in a specific sequence. DNA in the nucleus provides the genetic code that determines the sequence of these amino acids. The process of protein synthesis occurs in two main steps. Number one, transcription of DNA within the nucleus. And then step two, translation of RNA to proteins occurring at the ribosome in the cytoplasm. It is very important that you are able to describe the two steps making up protein synthesis. So during transcription, the double helix of DNA unwinds. In other words, it takes on the shape of a ladder. The double DNA stranded molecule unzips as the weak hydrogen bonds break and two separate strands are formed. Take note, only one strand will serve as a template to form mRNA. And mRNA is formed by using free RNA nucleotides from the nucleoplasm. mRNA is complementary to DNA. If the base triplet on the DNA is CCA, the codon on the mRNA will be GGU. Cytosine binds with guanine and uracil on mRNA binds with adenine on DNA. Remember, in RNA, thymine is replaced by uracil. mRNA now has the coded message for protein synthesis and mRNA takes this message to the ribosomes in the cytoplasm by leaving the nucleus through the nuclear pores. The second step in the process of protein synthesis is translation. This process occurs in the cytoplasm at the ribosomes. The single mRNA strand that was formed in the nucleus attaches to the ribosome mRNA now provides the code for the linking of the amino acids to form a specific protein. Each tRNA carries a specific amino acid. Each tRNA has three exposed nitrogenous bases known as an anticodon. The anticodon determines which amino acid will bind to the RNA. A specific tRNA brings the amino acid for which it is coded to the mRNA template. The codons of the mRNA determine which anticodons of tRNA will correspond. Codons and anticodons are thus complementary. For example, an mRNA strand with a GUC codon can only receive a tRNA molecule with a CAG anticodon. When the anticodon on the tRNA matches the codon on the mRNA, the tRNA brings the required amino acid to the ribosome. The amino acids become attached by means of peptide bonds and the required protein is formed. It is very important for you to carefully go through the steps of transcription and translation and memorize these two descriptions. Let us now go through a few questions. Question 2.1. The diagram below represents a single-stranded nucleic acid found in the nucleus. They're giving you a clue there. They talk about a nucleic acid. What's more, they talk about a single-stranded nucleic acid, so you should immediately know they're referring to RNA. That is then also the first question there, 2.1.1. Identify the molecule represented in this diagram. So it's RNA. 2.1.2. 
identify identified part X. You see there I have made um, circles around the four nucleotides. Remember, a nucleic acid is made up of nucleotides. In RNA, each nucleotide is made up of three components, a phosphate, a sugar, and a nitrogenous base. And that X there refers to a base. So X is a nitrogen base or a nitrogenous base. 2.1.2b, um, they're asking you to identify the sugar. Why? So why is the sugar in RNA? And you should know that the name of the sugar in RNA is ribose. 2.1.3, describe the process of transcription. We have just done it. In the previous slides, that's the first step of protein synthesis. So the DNA double helix will unwind. The double-stranded DNA molecule unzips. The weak hydrogen bonds break and the two strands separate. Remember, only one of those strands will serve as a template. And that template will be used to form mRNA using free RNA nucleotides from the nucleoplasm. The mRNA is a complement to DNA. So adenine and uracil will bind and guanine and cytosine will bind. mRNA now has that coded message that is needed for protein synthesis in the cytoplasm at the ribosomes. This question refers to a process that occurs during protein synthesis. We know that the process of protein synthesis occurs in two main steps. Remember, transcription takes place in the nucleus and translation takes place at the ribosomes. The first question there identify the above process. Okay, this is translation. Why translation? If you look at B, the molecule represented by B is mRNA. mRNA already received the coded message from DNA and has left the nucleus. It brings that code out into the cytoplasm at the ribosomes. Those structures labeled um, C, those are tRNA molecules, bringing forth the required amino acids. And those are things happening during translation. So this process represents translation. 3.1.2, identify organelle A. As you know or should know, translation happens at the ribosome. So the organelle involved here is the ribosome. Molecule B is that single-stranded mRNA molecule. The bond at E, look where E is found. Those amino acids are being joined by the bond at E. And two amino acids are joined by means of a peptide bond. 3.1.3, give only the letter. Read carefully what the instruction is. The letter of the molecule that carries the amino acid. That is tRNA, but you're not going to name the molecule. You're going to give the letter representing the tRNA, and that is C. The letter of the molecule that is copied from DNA, that is mRNA, and mRNA here is represented by B. The monomer or the building blocks of proteins, those are the amino acids, those um, square blocks carried by tRNA, so D represents an amino acid. Here is another example of a question on protein synthesis. So the diagram below shows protein synthesis. So it includes transcription and translation. All right, let's look at what they're giving us within this diagram. There's a double-stranded um, 
molecule represented by A, so that must be DNA, and then that DNA molecule untwists and unzips, and then one of those strands acts as a template to form B. So B must be mRNA, it's a single-stranded molecule, and it shows you that it's now moving out of the nucleus through a little opening within the membrane into the cytoplasm. And then in the cytoplasm, there are two tRNA molecules represented by D. Right, let's look at the questions. Identify structure C. Structure C is that opening within the nuclear membrane. So C is a nuclear pore. Molecule D, we've identified that as a tRNA. tRNA has three exposed bases known as an anticodon, so that must be tRNA. 4.1.2, name molecule A. We've identified that as DNA because of its um, double helix structure. And then molecule B is a single-stranded structure that was built onto one of the templates of A. So B must be mRNA. 4.1.3, tabulate two differences. I've highlighted tabulate there, Follow the instruction. So you have to put these differences in a table. And the differences must be B between the monomers of molecules A and B, the two molecules in question 4.1.2. So you have to tabulate any two differences between the building blocks of DNA and mRNA. Read very carefully. They don't ask you for differences in structure. They specifically want you to tabulate differences in the nucleotides of A and B. Right, the first difference. In DNA, the sugar is deoxyribose. And in RNA, the sugar is ribose. Another difference lies within the nitrogenous bases. DNA has thymine as one of the four nitrogenous bases. And RNA has uracil as one of the four nitrogenous bases. So those are two differences. You'll see that it's for five marks. So four marks will go for the two differences. And then the fifth mark will go for the table. So if you have um, these differences in a table, you will get that fifth mark. 4.1.4. Describe the role of A in transcription. So what role does DNA play within the transcription process? Remember, transcription is the first step within protein synthesis. Right, so DNA, the DNA double helix unwinds. It then unzips. And then the two strands separate only one of these strands will act as a template to form mRNA. Meiosis is a type of cell division where a diploid cell undergoes two cell divisions and divides to form four genetically different cells called the sex cells. Diploid cells have two sets of chromosomes where each chromosome has a homologous partner. In homologous chromosomes, one chromosome comes from the mother and the other chromosome from the father. Haploid cells only have one set of chromosomes. Chromosomes in haploid cells have no homologous partners. Before meiosis begins, DNA replication takes place during interphase. The result is two sets of chromosomes consisting of two identical chromatids joined together with a centromere. 
Make sure that you are able to differentiate between the following terms. That means know the difference. Haploid and diploid cells. Gametes or sex cells, it is the egg and the sperm, only have one set of chromosomes which is known as the haploid chromosome number or N. In human gametes, N equals 23. During fertilization, the egg and sperm, each with one set of chromosomes, fuse to form a zygote. Therefore, the zygote contains two sets of chromosomes. It is the diploid chromosome number, or 2N. The zygote divides by mitosis and forms an embryo consisting of many cells, each with a diploid chromosome number. In humans, the diploid chromosome number, or 2N, equals 46. So somatic cells are body cells with a diploid number of chromosomes. Gametes are sex cells with a haploid number of chromosomes. In humans, we have 23 homologous chromosome pairs, or 46 chromosomes in each somatic cell, consisting of 22 pairs of autosomes. These are ordinary chromosomes that have nothing to do with sex determination, and one pair of gonosomes, or the sex chromosomes. A female has two X gonosomes, where a male has one X and one Y gonosome. The chromosome composition in a female is 44 autosomes plus X, X gonosomes. The chromosome composition in a male is 44 autosomes plus X, Y gonosomes. Meiosis only occurs in reproductive organs. Mitosis is the division of somatic cells. New cells with the same chromosome number are formed during growth, repair of damaged tissues and asexual reproduction. Meiosis takes place during the formation of sex cells. In human males, meiosis takes place in the testes through a process known as spermatogenesis to form haploid sperm cells. In human females, meiosis takes place in the ovaries through a process known as eugenesis to form haploid egg cells or ova. In plants, meiosis occurs in the anther of the male reproductive organ to produce male gametes and also the ovary of the female reproductive system to form female gametes. A cell undergoing meiosis will divide twice. The first division is meiosis 1 and the second division is meiosis 2. Before meiosis takes place, the cell is in interphase, during which DNA replication takes place. At the end of interphase, each chromosome will consist of two chromatids joined by a centromere. This, this process takes place to double the genetic material so that it can be shared by the new cell arising from cell division. During meiosis 1, genetic material is exchanged and homologous chromo chromosome pairs separate. The chromosome number is halved. Meiosis 2 proceeds like normal mitosis where the two chromatids of a duplicated chromosome separate from each other. Both meiosis 1 and 2 have the same four phases, prophase, metaphase, anaphase and telophase. Next I'm going to take you through the events um, taking place during the phases of meiosis 1. Matrix, it is very important to know the events taking place in each phase and also to recognize, identify and label diagrams representing these phases. Let's see what happens during prophase 1. The chromatin network condenses and chromosomes become visible. The homologous chromosomes arrange themselves in pairs. The nuclear membrane and nucleolus start to disappear. Chromatids from each homologous chromosome pair touch at points known as chiasmata. The chromatid segments break off 
and are exchanged at the chiasma. This process is known as crossing over, and it results in the recombination of genetic material between maternal and paternal chromosomes. The centrioles start moving to opposite poles, and spindle fibers develop between these centrioles to form the spindle. Next up is metaphase 1. Homologous chromosomes line up along the equator in their homologous pairs. They arrange, they arrange themselves randomly. It is in no set pattern. We talk about it as random arrangement of chromosomes. So they line up in the middle of the cell. Metaphase, middle. Then moving on to anaphase 1. A for away. The spindle fibers contract and pull each chromosome of each chromosome pair to opposite poles of the cell. So the homologous chromosome pairs separate, moving away from each other during anaphase 1. And then lastly, telophase 1. Chromosomes reach the poles of the cell and a nuclear membrane forms around each group of chromosomes. Division of the cytoplasm, known as cytokinesis, takes place to form two daughter cells, each with half the number of chromosomes, that is, a haploid number. During meiosis 2, each cell formed during meiosis 1 will now divide again. During prophase 2, spindle fibers again form between the poles in each cell. Each chromosome is made up of two chromatids and a centromere, so the chromosomes are still duplicated. During metaphase 2, individual chromosomes line up at the equator in a single row. This arrangement is different from the arrangement in metaphase 1. During anaphase 2, the spindle fibers start to contract and centromeres split in half. Chromatids separate and are pulled to opposite poles. During telophase 2, unreplicated chromosomes reach each pole and a new nucleus form. The cytoplasm divides through cytokinesis and four haploid cells are formed. Each cell only has half the chromosome number of the original cell. These cells are, or gametes are all genetically different from each other. So, why is meiosis so important? During meiosis, the chromosome number is halved from the diploid to the haploid number. This ensures that sex cells have half the number of chromosomes so that when fertilization occurs, the zygote formed has the correct number of chromosomes. Gametes with different gene combinations are formed during meiosis. This leads to genetic variation in a population which ensures a better chance of survival. Genetic variation is made possible through crossing over, taking place during prophase 1, and also this, the random arrangement of chromosomes at the equator during metaphase 1 and 2. So, to summarize the importance of meiosis, meiosis ensure chromosome number is halved and meiosis introduces genetic variation. Right, next we're going to look at some example questions. This diagram represents a cell during cell division. The first question that they asked is what type of cell division is shown in the diagram above. So you have to determine whether this diagram represents a phase during mitosis or meiosis. If you look at the cell, you will notice that the chromosomes are duplicated and the duplicated chromosomes are arranged in homologous pairs. So this can only be meiosis 1. Number 2.2, .2, identify the phase represented by this diagram. So one of the phases during meiosis 1, which one 
is represented by this diagram. You can clearly see that the chromosomes are arranged at the equator. So that must make you think of metaphase immediately. Metaphase for middle. And what's more, they are arranged in homologous chromosome pairs. So that means this diagram represents metaphase 1. Question 2.3. Give the letter or letters that represent or represents the letter only. A. The structure that moves or pulls the chromosomes or the chromatids to the poles during cell division. That is, of course, the spindle fiber, and the spindle fiber is represented here by the letter B. 2.3b, the part that is responsible for forming the spindle fibers, that is the centriole, and the centriole is represented by letter F. So you do not give the name of these structures, you only give the letter that they represent. 2.3c, two chromatids that are identical. If you look at these chromosomes, chromosome at the top right hand corner, those two chromatids D and E look exactly the same. Crossing over hasn't taken place yet and the one chromatid has made a copy of itself during DNA replication. So D and E are the two chromatids that are identical. Question 2.4 how many chromosomes will be found in each daughter cell at the end of this cell division? So this is metaphase 1. During anaphase 1, the homologous chromosome pairs will separate from each other. So four chromosomes will move to the one pole and four chromosomes will move to the next pole. So there's a total of eight chromosomes in this cell. When this cell eventually splits up into two, the chromosome number will be halved. So each daughter cell will have four chromosomes, which would be a haploid number. Question 2.5. Give the name of the cells that will be formed as a result of this type of cell division, specifically in a male. Now we know that meiosis takes place to form sex cells. And the sex cells in a male are known as sperm cells. Let's look at another example of a question on meiosis. The diagrams below represent different phases of meiosis in an organism. Three diagrams are given. Before you start attempting the questions, Carefully look at the information given by each diagram and try to figure out which phase is represented. In diagram 1, there are two chromosomes. Both chromosomes are still duplicated. In other words, chromosome is made up of two chromatids joined by means of a centromere. There are no homologous chromosome pairs. Um, Crossing over already took place because the chromatids making up a duplicated chromosome are not identical. The centrioles are still in the process of moving towards opposite poles. So this looks like prophase 2. If you look at diagram 2, the homologous chromosome pairs are arranged at the equator. So that is a clear indication that it must be metaphase 1. Looking at diagram 3, the chromosomes are unduplicated, so the chromosomes have, the chromatids have already separated and have moved away from each other to opposite poles. A for away, this diagram must represent anaphase 2. Right, let's look at the questions. Identify the following parts. A, a represents that structure joining two chromatids. So A is a centromere. B refers to two duplicated chromosomes. 
in a pair. So that must be a homologous chromosome pair. C refers to that spindle fiber contracting and pulling the chromatid support. So C is a spindle fiber. Moving on to question 3.2, identify the phase represented in diagram 3. We've already identified diagram 3 as anaphase 2. Write down the numbers of the diagrams to show the sequence or the order in which these phases occur. So we know diagram 1 is prophase 2, diagram 2 is metaphase 1, and diagram 3 is anaphase 2. So the order in which these phases will occur would be metaphase 1, prophase 2, and then anaphase 2. So write down the numbers of the diagrams to show this order, and that would be 2, 1, 3. The last question, question 3.4, state one difference between metaphase 1 and metaphase 2. During metaphase 1, the chromosomes are arranged in pairs at the equator. And during metaphase 2, the chromosomes line up in a single row at the equator. This topic contains quite a few new terms and concepts that you have to familiarize yourself with in order to understand, interpret and do genetic crosses. You know all about chromosomes already from the topic on meiosis. Chromosomes become visible towards the end of interface when the chromatin network condenses and each chromosome then is made up of two chromatids and a centromere. A gene is a small segment of a DNA molecule that controls a specific hereditary characteristic, for example, eye color or plant length. The alternative forms of the same gene are known as alleles. Different alleles contain different information about the same characteristic. The alleles of a particular gene occur at the same locus on a specific homologous chromosome pair. So the locus refers to the position of the gene on the chromosome. When two alleles for a particular characteristic on the homologous chromosome are the same, the individual is said to be homozygous for that particular trait. When the two alleles on the homologous chromosome uh, differ from each other, the individual is heterozygous for that particular trait. One allele of a gene pair can mask another, and this is known as the dominant allele. The allele that is masked is called recessive. The composition of the gene pair, or the two alleles then for a specific trait, is known as the genotype. An organism's genotype is represented by two letters. Each letter represents one allele of the gene that controls the trait. A capital letter shows the dominant allele and a small letter the recessive allele. Let's look at an example. The characteristic of plant length in pea plants. Pea plants have two alleles for plant length, tall and short. Tall is dominant over short. The letter capital T is used from the first letter of the word tall. The symbols for the two alleles are tall, capital T, representing the dominant allele, and short, small letter T. This is the allele that is masked and therefore the recessive allele. The observable characteristics or the physical appearance of an organism is known as its phenotype. Let's go back to the example of pea plants. A plant with a genotype capital T, capital T, has two alleles for tall and appears tall. So the phenotype 
is tall. The genotype is big T, big T. A plant with a genotype small t, small t, has two alleles for short and appears short. Short is the phenotype and the genotype is small t, small t. A plant with a genotype capital T and small t has one allele for tall and one allele for short. Given that tall is dominant over short, the tall trait dominates and the plant appears tall. Take note, grade 12s, a paper 2 question paper will contain a genetic cross. So it is very important that you practice this template very well. By following this template, you already have earned two marks for stating P1 and F1 and also meiosis and fertilization. We will practice this template for a genetic cross in the next slides. A monohybrid cross is a cross involving only one characteristic. Mono means one. Examples, flower color, shape of seeds, eye color. Complete dominance refers to a cross where the dominant allele masks or hides um, the expression of the recessive allele in the heterozygous condition. Now let's practice a genetic cross. Read through the question very carefully. In dogs, rough hair, represented by a big H, is dominant to smooth hair, represented by a small H. A heterozygous rough haired dog is mated with a smooth haired dog. Represent a genetic cross to show the phenotypic ratio of the puppies. First thing you do is to write down the template for a genetic cross. Go back to the question and identify the phenotypes of the parents. Remember, phenotype, a phenotype refers to the physical appearance. A rough haired dog is mated with a smooth haired dog. So one parent has rough hair and the other parent has smooth hair. Now fill in these phenotypes next to P1 phenotypes on your template, rough hair crossed with smooth hair. Next, you identify the genotypes of the parents. Remember, genotype refers to the genetic makeup. It is stated that the parent with rough hair is heterozygous. Remember, heterozygous means the two alleles differ from each other. In other words, a capital letter and a small letter. Use the symbols given in the question. So the parent with rough hair has the genotype of big H, small H. Fill that in on your template next to genotype under rough hair. The other parent shows the recessive trait and can therefore only be homozygous. Remember, homozygous means the two alleles are the same and therefore the genotype for smooth hair is small h, small h. Fill that in on your template next to genotype under smooth hair. The next step is to show how alleles are separated through meiosis into separate gametes. So the gametes of the parent with rough hair will contain either the big H allele or the small H allele. The gametes of the parent with smooth hair can only contain the small H allele. The next step is to use the Punnett square to show that fertilization is taking place. Indicate all combinations of gametes from the one parent with the gametes of the other parent to show the possible genotypes of the F1 generation. This F1 generation will have two big H, small H, and two small h, small h genotypes. Next, you interpret the phenotypes of all the possible genotypes from this cross. Big h, small h will show a phenotype of rough hair. And small h, small h will show a phenotype 
of smooth hair. Therefore, the phenotypic ratio is two rough hair to two smooth hair, or simplified, one rough hair to one smooth hair. The percentage chance of these two parents having a rough haired puppy is 50%, but there is also a 50% chance of having a smooth haired puppy. Let us look at another example. In rabbits, black fur is produced by the allele big B and white fur by the allele small b. The table below shows the genotypes of some rabbits. Rabbit 1, big B, big B. Rabbit 2, big B, small b. Rabbit 3, small b, small b. Use a genetic cross to show the percentage chance of rabbits 1 and 3 having offspring with white fur. Remember, the first thing you do is to write down the template for a genetic cross and then to identify the phenotypes and genotypes. You have to cross rabbit 1 and 3. The genotypes of these rabbits are given. Because it is stated that black is produced by a big B allele, you can assume that black is dominant over the white allele. So rabbit 1 with a genotype of homozygous big B, big B has a black phenotype. And rabbit 3 with a genotype of homozygous small b, small b, b is white. On the next slide, we will continue with this cross. Fill in the phenotypes and the genotypes of the P1 generation. Next, you show how the alleles are separated through meiosis into separate gametes. Gametes of rabbit 1 can only contain the big B allele and the gametes of rabbit 3 can only contain the small B allele. Show that fertilization is taking place by using the Punnett square and determine, determine the possible genotypes of the F1 generation. There will only be big B, small B offspring the genotype of all the offspring will be big B, small b, and therefore a phenotype of black. So there is a 100% chance of rabbit 1 and 3 having offspring with black fur. To answer the final question, you have to state what is the percentage chance of rabbits 1 and 3 having offspring with white fur. And there is of course a 0% chance of them having offspring with white fur. Remember, practice makes perfect, so practice these genetic crosses. Gregor Mendel, who is considered the father of genetics, also carried out crosses where two pairs of contrasting characteristics carried on different homologous chromosomes were investigated. This is known as a dihybrid cross. Mendel did crosses where he looked at the inheritance of seed color and seed shape simultaneously. Mendel's law of independent assortment states that the various factors controlling the different characteristics are separate entities, not influencing each other in any way and sorting themselves out independently during gamete formation. Let us look at an exemplar question on a dihybrid cross. Read through the question carefully. In humans, short fingers, big F, and a widow's beak, big H, are dominant over long fingers and continuous hairline. A man and a woman, both heterozygous for the two characteristics, plan on having a child. The table below shows the possible genotypes of the offspring. So the two characteristics that are mentioned are length of finger and shape of hairline. Short fingers are dominant over long fingers. 
The allele for short fingers is represented by big F, so allele for long finger will be represented by small f. Widow's peak is dominant over continuous hairline. The allele for widow's peak is there for big H and the allele for continuous hairline, which is the recessive trait, is represented by small h. Both parents are heterozygous for both the two characteristics. Remember, heterozygous means the two alleles differ. So the genotype for both parents is big F, small f, big H, small h. And the phenotype for both parents is short fingers and widow's peak. In the given Punnett square, one can see how the alleles could come together randomly to form four types of gametes for each parent, highlighted in red at the top and side of the Punnett square. They are big F, big H, big F, small H, small F, big H, and small F, small H. Because of random fertilization, Gametes from both parents could fuse in different combinations to form the offspring. All these possible genotypes are indicated in the given Punnett square. So we have analysed all the given information. Let us tackle the questions. Question 1.6.1 State the genotype at Z. Join gamete small f small h from the one parent with gametes small f big h from the other parent the resulting genotype is small f small f big h small h so the genotype at z is small f small f big h small h question 1.6.2 a Give the genotype of the parents. They are both heterozygous for both characteristics, so the alleles for both characteristics must differ. Therefore, the genotype for both parents must be big F, small f, big H, small h. 1.6.2b Give the number of genotypes that could result in offspring with short fingers and a continuous hairline. So how many genotypes with short fingers and a continuous hairline? The possible combinations are big F, big F, small h, small h, and big F, small f, small h, small h. Count how many of these you can find on the Punnett square. They are indicated by a yellow marker. There are three of them. So the number of genotypes that could result in offspring with short fingers and a continuous hairline is three. Question 1.6.2c. Give the allele for a continuous hairline. Continuous hairline is the recessive trait, so it's indicated by a small h. 1.6.2d Give the phenotype of a child who is homozygous recessive for both characteristics. Phenotype refers to the physical appearance. This child shows, shows both recessive traits, so the phenotype is long fingers and continuous hairline. A pedigree diagram is used to study the inheritance of characteristics in a family over a number of generations. You must be able to interpret a pedigree diagram like this one. This pedigree diagram shows inheritance of eye color in humans over three generations of a family. Brown eye color, big B, is dominant over blue eye color, small b. The squares represent males 
and the circles represent females. The horizontal line between a square and a circle shows that they have mated. A vertical line from the horizontal line shows the offspring of the parents. So Joshua and Renal are the parents of Sarah and Peter. Veronica and Peter have five children. Use the given key to determine the phenotypes and genotypes of all the individuals. Joshua, John and Jack are males with blue eyes. Blue eye color is recessive, so the genotype of those three males is small b, small b. Peter and Frank are males with brown eyes. Brown eye color is dominant, so their genotypes could be big B, big B, or big B, small B. But, Peter has children with blue eyes, so one recessive allele must have come from parent Peter, so Peter's genotype must be big B, small B. Frank has a blue-eyed mother, Veronica, with a genotype small b, small b, b. So Frank got a big B from Peter, his father, and a small b from his mother, Veronica. So Frank's genotype can only be big B, small b. Renal has brown eyes. There is too little information to determine whether she has the genotype big B, big B, or big B, small b. So you have to give both options if asked for her genotype. I will now work through a question on a pedigree diagram from last year's final paper 2. Read the question carefully and interpret the, the pedigree diagram. One type of deafness in humans is carried on a single allele. The diagram below shows the inheritance of deafness in a family. Question 2.4.1 How many generations are represented in this pedigree diagram? As I have indicated on the diagram in red, there are three generations. Question 2.4.1b How many children of Paul and Lizzie are able to hear? Well, Paul and Lizzie have three children. According to the key, two of those three children can hear. I've highlighted those two children in yellow. Question 2.4.2 Which phenotype is dominant? That would be hearing. In 2.4.3 you have to explain your answer. So you have to use the offspring of Bob and Anne to explain your answer to question 2.4.2. .2. According to the key, both Bob and Anne can hear, but they have a child that is deaf. That means that the child must have gotten one recessive allele from each parent. But in the parents, each recessive allele is masked by the dominant allele for hearing. So you can conclude that hearing must be the dominant trait. Question 2.4.4 Use the letter big A to represent the dominant allele and the letter small a for the recessive allele to give all the possible genotypes for a hearing individual. Because hearing is the dominant trait, the genotypes could be Big A, Big A, or Big A, Small A. Evolution is a general term that may be defined as change over time. These changes may occur in um, chemicals, uh, solar systems, populations, environments, etc. 
biological evolution can be described as genetic changes within a population that are inherited over generations due to natural selections and may ultimately result in the formation of new species. It is important to know the difference between a species and a population. A species is a group of organisms that are able to interbreed and produce fertile offspring. A population is a group of organisms of the same species that live in a particular place at a particular time with the ability to interbreed and produce fertile offspring. Genetic variation occurs within species with the result that organisms of the same species show slight differences in appearance. Genetic variation is important for the survival of organisms in changing environments. And genetic variation is caused by meiosis, mutations and reproduction. Two processes during meiosis contribute to genetic var variation. They are crossing over during prophase 1 and random arrangement of chromosomes during metaphase 1 or 2. A, mu a mutation changes the structure of a gene or a chromosome and therefore the, the organism's genotype. Under reproduction, random mating and random fertilization also increase variation within a species. It is important to understand the difference between a theory and a hypothesis. A theory is an explanation of something that has been observed in nature, which can be supported by facts, tested hypotheses and laws. A hypothesis is a possible solution to a problem, in other words, a prediction of a possible outcome. You are expected to know ideas on evolution in the order of their origin. I will discuss Lamarckism, Darwinism and punctuated equilibrium. Lamarck and Charles Darwin were two scientists whose views greatly contributed to the formulation of the theory of evolution. Lamarck explained evolution using the following two laws. The law of use and disuse, stating that the use or disuse of organs may cause the organs to shrink or enlarge or even disappear. And the law of the inheritance of acquired traits, stating that characteristics developed during the life of an organism can be passed on to their offspring. After the discovery of modern genetics, Lamarck's laws were completely rejected, as only genetic characteristics can be inherited and not something that you required during your lifetime. Darwin explained evolution in terms of natural selection, which states the following. There is a great deal of variation among members of the same species. Some organisms have favorable characteristics, which enable them to cope with challenges in the environment, and they survive, produce, and pass on this favorable allele to their offspring. Organisms which do not have favorable characteristics to cope with challenges in their environment die. The next generation will have a higher proportion of individuals with a favorable characteristic. Study this description of the theory of evolution by natural selection very well. Punctuated equilibrium explains the long periods in the fossil record where species remained unchanged. This alternates with short periods of time where rapid changes occur through natural selection and new species may form in a relatively short period of time. Artificial selection is the deliberate breeding of plant, plants and animals for their desirable characteristics that would benefit humans and not necessarily benefit the survival of the offspring. For example, breeding sheep for wool, racehorses for speed, um, cows for increased milk production, sugarcane for highest yield. Make sure you are able to tabulate the differences between natural selection and artificial selection. 
Speciation refers to the formation of a new species, and this process therefore increases biodiversity. Remember, a species can be defined as a group of organisms with the ability to interbreed and produce fertile offspring. Allopatric speciation, or geographic speciation, is when a new species arises from an existing species when the populations are separated by a geographical barrier. A population can be separated geographically by a river, or a lake, or a mountain, the ocean, a road, or even a desert. The separation results in two populations that develop in isolation from each other and are unable to crossbreed because of this geographical barrier. These two populations are now reproductively isolated because there is no gene flow between the two populations. Each population may be exposed to different environmental conditions. Natural selection occurs independently in each area and different traits are selected as beneficial in each environment. Eventually, the gene pools of the two populations become very different in their phenotype and genotype. If the two populations have to meet again, they will not be able to reproduce with each other as they are genetically too different. These two populations are now different species. Make sure you learn this process very well step by step and do not confuse this with natural selection. Read a question carefully to determine which description is asked for. Natural selection and speciation can also be used to explain how humans have evolved. Scientists identify trends in human evolution by comparing humans to other primates in terms of similarities and differences. The differences point to the existence of different species, while the similarities point to a possible common ancestor. We will now go through um, some questions on human evolution. The diagram below shows possible evolutionary relationships between hominids. What is this type of diagram called? This is a phylogenetic tree. A phylogenetic tree refers to a branching diagram that shows lines of evolutionary descent of different species from a common ancestor. I made a little green dot showing the common ancestor of all the species in this phylogenetic tree. All the branches are branching off from that point. The most recent common ancestor for different species can be, fo can be found at the point where the branches join from those different species. For example, the most recent common ancestor for Paranthropus ethiopicus and Paranthropus bazae would be at the red dot. The most recent common ancestor for Paranthropus ethiopicus, Paranthropus bazae and Homo would be at the little blue dot. Then question 2.5.2. How many genera are shown in the diagram above? I have highlighted the different genera in this phylogenetic tree in yellow. Remember, in a scientific name, the first term is the genus name and the second, the species name. So there are four different genera in this particular phylogenetic tree. They are Ardipithecus, Australopithecus, Paranthropus, and Homo. Question 2.5.3. According to this diagram, which genus is most recently evolved? That is Paranthropus. The split happened at the red dot, and this is the most recent in time. 
Then according to this diagram, which genus is the oldest? That is Ardipithecus. That split happened at the green dot, which is the furthest back in time. According to this diagram, which hominid share a common ancestor with Oslipithecus africanus? Look at the two purple highlighted branches. Oslipithecus africanus shares a common ancestor with Paranthropus robustus. Then question 2.5.4. The last two questions don't have, um, they're not specifically related to this phylogenetic tree. They involve fossils that you must learn and know. 2.5.4. Give one example of an Oslipithecus africanus fossil found in South Africa. Um, there is Mrs. Place, and then another option is Tahun Child. They're asking for one example, so any one of those two options. 2.5.5 Name two Homo species besides Homo sapiens that were found in Africa. Um, there's Homo erectus, there's Homo habilis, and the most recent one, Homo naledi. So any two of those three options. Humans share the following characteristics with other primates. Opposable thumbs that allow monkeys to have a power grip, while humans are capable of a power grip as well as a precision grip. Long arms that rotate freely as shoulder joints allow movement in all directions. Naked fingertips and toes ending in flat nails instead of claws. Stereoscopic vision as the eyes face forward providing depth of field or 3D vision. And then brain centers that process information from hands and eyes are enlarged. These are some of the anatomical similarities between African apes and humans. This table shows a comparison between the anatomical characteristics of humans and African apes according to the features listed in the first column. Know these differences well. We will take a look at some of these differences in more detail on slides to follow with the help of diagrams. The greatest observable difference between apes and humans lies in the difference in posture and method of locomotion. Apes are four-footed or quadrupedal. Humans, however, are bipedal and walk upright. In bipedal humans, the foramen magnum shifted to a more forward position so that the skull rests on top of the vertebral column and the eyes face forward. In quadrupedal apes, the head is positioned in front of the vertebral column with a foramen magnum in a more backward position. Some advantages of bipedalism include upright bodies exposed to a smaller surface area to the sun, which reduces risk of overheating while hunting or escaping predators. Upright bodies also expose a larger surface area to air currents, which cause cooling and reduces dependency on water. And then hands are also free to use tools, prepare food, carry the young, hunt or fight. Vision extends further over the tall grass to find food or avoid predators. The cranium of apes is small, and elongated and contains a small, less developed brain. Humans have a more rounded skull with an enlarged cranium which contains a large, highly developed brain. The more complex human brain gave rise to well-developed hand-eye co coordination which helped in the making and use of tools, the capacity for language and also the use of fire. 
The human vertebral column is S-shaped for flexibility and shock absorption. The vertebral column of apes is C-shaped. The palate in apes is narrow and rectangular. In humans, the palate became wider and more curved. The curved palate of modern humans aided the development of speech. The size of teeth decreased with the course of evolution. Apes have large prominent canines that are larger than other teeth. In apes, there is a large gap known as the diastema between the incisors and the canines. It provides space for the protruding canines on the opposite jaw so that the mouth can close. The human canines are the same size as the other teeth and the diastema disappeared completely over time. Apes have large protruding jaws without a chin. Their jaws protrude beyond the upper part of the face, which results in a sloping face. Humans have a narrow flat face with rounded jaws and a protruding chin. The forehead appears more vertical as a result of the larger cranium that contains a larger brain. Apes have prominent cranial and brow ridges for attachment of well-developed chewing muscles. Male gorillas have the most prominent cranial ridges of any of the living hominids. The cranial and brow ridges are completely reduced in humans. The human pelvic girdle has become larger, shorter and wider to support the greater weight due to the upright posture. The pelvic girdles of apes are long and narrow. Let's do some questions again. Humans and African apes share many characteristics, yet each is a distinct species. Name five characteristics that humans share with African apes. In other words, similarities. These are some of those similarities. They both have opposable thumbs, long upper arms, freely rotating arms, eyes to the front for stereoscopic vision, flat nails instead of claws, parts of the brain processing information from hands and eyes are enlarged, a larger brain, eyes with cones for color vision. So choose five and learn them very well. The next question, describe how each of the following structures are different between humans and apes. And first of all, the, the spine. So how does the spine differ in humans and apes? In humans, the spine is S-shaped and in apes, the spine is C-shaped. How does the pelvic girdle differ between humans and apes? The pelvic girdle in humans is short and wide. The pelvic girdle in African apes is long and narrow. Right then, question 3.3.3. Explain the significance of the changes to the teeth of humans that show progression in evolution. Now, this is a slightly higher order question. Look at the stem word there. Explain the significance. It's for four marks. So you have to state what the change was and then also why there was this change. So the canines change from large to smaller, larger in apes to smaller in humans. So that's the change. Why this change? Eating raw food to eating cooked food. So there are your other two marks. So from larger teeth to smaller teeth, eating raw food to cooked food. The diagram below shows the skull of three primogenera 
and is not drawn to scale. Question 1.4.1. Name parts B and C respectively. Structure B there refers to the cranium. It's the top part of the skull. And C is a brow ridge. You can see it's very prominent in that genus. Question 1.4.2. Name the type of teeth that is larger in genus 3 compared to that of genera 1 and 2. Those are, of course, the canines. The canines are much larger in um, genus 3 than in 1 and 2. Question 1.4.3. Give only the numbers 1, 2 or 3 of the skull or skull stat and then they give you descriptions. Look at the stem word there. Give and only the number. Okay, so the number of the skull that most likely belongs to a bipedal primate. And there are two of them, genus 1 and also genus 2. So 1 and 2 are most likely belonging to a bipedal, an upright primate. B has the largest brain size, that would be 2. You can see that top part of the skull, the cranium, is much bigger than the other two, so it has more space for a bigger brain. C is attached to a C-shaped vertebral column, and that is skull or uh, genus 3. 1.4.3D is most prognathous. Now, prognathous means a more protruding jaw. And that is also um, number three. Question 1.4.4. Give only the letter of the structure that is more pronounced in organism three than in organisms one and two. And that is, of course, C. We've labeled C earlier on as the brow riches. 1.4.5. Give the correct sequence of the organisms 1, 2, and 3 from most primitive to most evolved. And that sequence would be 3, 1, 2. I wish you all the best for your upcoming life sciences exams. Remember, hard work pays off. You will see it in your results. Best of luck.